21e siècle, on est dans une ville européenne et on a des tirs de missiles de croisière comme si on était en Irak ou en Afghanistan, vous imaginez Parce que ce sont des Européens de culture, même si on n'est pas dans l'Union européenne, on est avec une population qui est très proche, très voisine. On ne parle pas là de Syriens qui fuient, qui fuient les bombardements du régime syrien soutenu par Vladimir Poutine. On parle d'Européens qui partent dans leur voiture, qui ressemblent à nos voitures. This isn't a place, with all due respect, um, you know, like Iraq or Afghanistan that has seen conflict raging for decades. You know, this is a relatively civilized. Nous ne sommes pas face à des migrants qui vont passer dans une logique d'immigration. Il y a une différence entre les Ukrainiens qui, encore une fois, participent de notre espace civilisationnel avec des, des populations euh, qui euh, appartiennent à d'autres civilisations. noticed from the last few weeks, refugees coming from Ukraine have not been welcomed in the same way as other refugees have. Whereas people coming from the global south continue to struggle to seek refuge in the EU, we are witnessing an immense wave of solidarity toward people fleeing the war in Ukraine. What we've seen is that bordering countries have opened their doors across Europe, people have donated supplies and many have even decided to welcome fleeing Ukrainians inside their home. Yet, for decades, the EU's approach has been one centered on border security, sealing its external borders and assisting unlawful and violent pushbacks of individuals to countries where their lives are threatened, subjected to torture and inhumane treatment. Every year, a staggering number of people from Africa and the Middle East die attempting to reach Europe's border crossing the Mediterranean. So clearly, there is a stark contrast between the current response to the Ukrainian crisis and Europe's harsh policies towards people fleeing the other wars and humanitarian crises in Africa or the Middle East. While we can commend the generosity of Europeans demonstrated towards people fleeing the war in Ukraine, this difference of treatment highlights the unequal distribution of the supposedly universal values of humanity in European migration policies. Welcome to our podcast entitled Same but Different, Questioning European Humanitarian Responses in the Mediterranean after Ukraine. This podcast aims to present a fresh perspective on the long-standing Mediterranean problem. We ask, how does the European response to the migration influx from Ukraine impact the way we think about the humanitarian crisis in the Mediterranean? Here with us today is Stéphane de Cré, Head of Citizen Mobilization at SOS Mediterranean Switzerland. SOS Méditerranée is a citizen-led NGO involved in the search and rescue of migrants in distress in the Mediterranean Sea. Founded in 2015, their operation started in February 2016, and they have since provided assistance to more than 34,000 people crossing the Mediterranean Sea. Welcome, Stefan. Thank you very much. I'm just going to dive right in and ask you firstly, do you think that widespread acceptance of refugees from Ukraine questions existing EU institutions, policies and responses to migration? I think it questions the, um, the way these issues are framed in the public debate. If you look at how the, the public debate was framed over the last four or five years on the issues of migration and asylum, uh, they have been framed, as you said, as Um, security, border security, and sometimes also identity issues. And doing that, we forgot completely the human issues um, that are behind the, the migration. We forgot also the humanitarian issues, as well as the legal aspect, because it's a field that is like regulated and framed by the international law. And uh, we totally forgot about some uh, key principle of international law over the last years. And what is indeed uh, very interesting with the situation in Ukraine is that for the first time in many years, we have been like putting these uh, human and humanitarian aspects in the forefront in the way uh, the public debate over migration is framed. And this is a kind of a change of paradigm. And the second very interesting thing is European solidarity. I'm not talking here at the citizen level, but at the state level. For the first time, the countries uh, situated, located at the um, external borders, so in the case of Ukraine, it would be Poland, Hungary, and Romania. For the first time, these 
countries were not left alone to manage this situation, but all the countries of the European Union and all the European countries, because Switzerland as well, for instance, reacted and showed solidarity toward the situation. This is something we haven't seen in the past with the countries located at the southern border. So, for instance, Italy, uh, that were very much left alone to deal with the, the migration situation. So these are two main changes that we have been witnessing over the last few weeks. Um, yeah. Indeed, what you're referring to is the Dublin system, whereby the European state in which the asylum seeker first sets foot is responsible for granting asylum. This results in the disproportionate distribution of asylum requests to Mediterranean countries. By contrast, this time around, the European Union as a bloc decided to offer temporary protection to all Ukrainians, invoking for the first time a directive from 2001 that enabled uprooted persons to skip the bureaucracy of the normal asylum to stay, work, and put their children in school automatically. This leads me to my next question, which is specifically about your work in the citizen mobilization section of SOS Mediterranée. With the current media attention on the influx of Ukrainian refugees into the EU, does this have any effect on your efforts to encourage humanitarian solidarity for the migrants crossing the Mediterranean? I think what it's interesting, um, one of our mission and what we are doing with citizen mobilization at SOS Mediterranean is to raise awareness about the situation in the Mediterranean Sea, but also to raise awareness about the legal framework and about the legal obligations also that states have in the field of uh, migration and in the field of uh, rescue at sea, uh, in the case of SOS Mediterranean. And it is just really powerful for us to uh, enhance this like difference of treatment between uh, refugees coming from Ukraine and refugees coming from other countries and to stress that the legal situation is exactly the same. And people fleeing a conflict in a country uh, on the African continent or in a country in the Middle East have exactly the same rights than people fleeing the conflict in Ukraine. And this is a powerful statement that we can make and think about why are they uh, welcoming more easily people coming from Ukraine than people coming from other countries. Indeed, that's a great question asked by Stéphane, which echoes Didier Fassin's discussion on the hierarchies of humanity and the politics of life embedded in humanitarian responses which entail the evaluation of the relative worth of different lives. Comparing humanitarian approaches provided to Ukrainian migrants on the one hand and migrants attempting to cross the Mediterranean on the other shows the existing tensions between the ideal of universality or the abstract principle of treating everyone in the same way and the concrete practice of difference when it comes to the distant other. But what accounts for these differences in treatment? So hopefully there's going to be some opportunities for advocating for institutional change also within the EU. And of course, there's the other side of the coin. The media and politicians are portraying the influx of Ukrainian asylum seekers as an identity issue. For instance, as we heard at the beginning of the podcast, the narrative is often demarcating Ukrainian asylum seekers from the other refugees and so-called illegal migrants. To what extent are identity and ethnicity determining factors influencing whether the European response is rather humanitarian or securitized? The response that we have to, to provide and um, the way states have to act is not based on identity, it is based on law and on the legal principle. And we are living in countries that apply the rule of law. We are living in an international community that is regulated by international law. And everyone has the same rights, according to the law, independently of their country of origin, independently of their religion or color of skin. And yeah, once again, uh, someone fleeing the um, conflict in the Tigray region in Ethiopia has exactly the same rights to be entitled an international protection as someone fleeing the Ukrainian conflict. So in regard of the law, there is absolutely no difference. If we are applying different treatment to people fleeing the same kind of situation, which is a war, it means that we are breaking the law. And since you talk about breaking the law, I think states' responses to SOS Mediterranean search and rescue operations at sea are also very telling of the securitized approach to migration and border control that has characterized European policy before Ukraine. 
Can you tell us about SOS Mediterranean's experience concerning European external border security? Yeah, exactly. We are um, like almost coming back to the beginning of this interview when I was saying that we forgot uh, about the, the human and the humanitarian aspect of this issue. So basically what we have uh, in the Mediterranean Sea is a humanitarian crisis on our doorsteps because it is really like on European doorsteps. We have more than 20,000 people who died uh, in the Mediterranean Sea since 2014. If you take the region between Libya and Europe, you have 1,500 people who died just last year in 2021. So this is basically a humanitarian crisis. And what was the reaction of the European countries on this humanitarian crisis? It is, as you said, the reaction to try to criminalize the organization that are trying to bring a response on the humanitarian response to people in need. So what happened? We had a first boat, a first ship since 2016 that was called the Aquarius. And uh, in 2018, this ship lost its uh, flag. So basically it's a registration um, that was Gibraltar at first and then Panama. And it lost both registrations on over like political pressures to uh, basically stop our actions. So um, the Aquarius couldn't operate anymore. And then in uh, 2019, we came again with another um, uh, ship, which is the Ocean Viking, which is still our current ship. And we could operate. And then in 2020, just after the COVID outbreak, um, the ship was blocked on administrative grounds for several months. And we couldn't operate during several months because our ship was in administrative detention in, in Italy. So um, there has been a yeah, massive scrutiny over our action, over the action of all uh, humanitarian NGOs active at sea, trying for like, a long period to prevent uh, indeed uh, our action. Do you think the positive reception of Ukrainian refugees will have a spillover effect on the work of organizations focusing on migration in the Mediterranean? Um, so now it's only a matter of a few weeks. So it's really too early to tell if it will have long-lasting consequences and if it will last over the time and uh, also change something on the other migration routes, uh, such as the, the route uh, across Mediterranean and Sea, that is the one uh, where we are active. So in the, the, the war in Ukraine started only six weeks ago, so it's way too soon to draw any conclusion. I mean... Over the, the next month, I don't expect to see any big shift in the way the, the situation in the Mediterranean Sea is being handled. But over the long term, we can hope. We have highlighted the contrast between the EU's humanitarian response to the influx of refugees from Ukraine with the European reception of asylum seekers fleeing wars in the global south. Although the situation of asylum seekers is very similar, the nature of the EU's response diverges and underscores the tension between humanitarian values and the securitization of borders. The fact that Stefan describes the situation and the responses to the Mediterranean crisis as unlikely to significantly improve in the near future, even after the wave of solidarity for Ukrainians we are witnessing, is very telling. The increasing securitization of migration gives rise to what William Walters has called the humanitarian border. From this point of view, the border between Europe and the Middle East and North Africa is redefined as a space of humanitarian crisis governed by a complex assemblage of different actors, including both states and non-state actors like the NGO SOS Méditerranée. The humanitarian border materializes other in a concrete way, shedding light on the sharp contrast between wealth and poverty, citizenship and non-citizenship. The migrants crossing the Mediterranean to knock on Europe's door convey an important message. Their journey is a form of protest against the increasingly unequal distribution of wealth and security in the world. Perhaps the key takeaway is that humanitarian responses to the Mediterranean problem cannot be understood in isolation from its underlying root causes, with prevailing inequalities between global north and south remaining unaddressed.